Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that. You know, I was having a perfectly nice time before you interrupted me back there, but <laughs> we'll carry on. Um, some of the Gingrich folks were talking about what a beautiful day it is in here in Tennessee. I said, every day is a beautiful day here in Tennessee. I was apologizing for the bad weather we were having today, but uh, it's certainly good to be back with you and see so many uh, old friends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make this very brief. Um, I've been asked several times since uh, I've been up here today what I'm doing here and why I'm doing it. And the answer is very simple. It's the same reason that you all elected me to the Senate in, in 1994 for the first time. And that is I'm concerned about my country. I think that we're at the tipping point in a lot of different respects in this country. Uh, in the bad way. When you've got a debt that's big as the entire economy of the country, which there's only three or four European countries in worse shape than we are in that respect. You've got a serious problem when you've got a president who is intent not only on not doing anything about it, but demagoguing anybody that tries to do anything about it while he's trying to divide the American people. It's the only way he feels like he can, can get reelected. You've got a serious situation on your hand. I went, uh, with your help, in 94, uh, actually in 95 to uh, United States Senate in large part because of uh, the gentleman we're here uh, about today. A lot of people are talking the right kind of talk today. It doesn't take much to run a poll and find out what people want to hear and they're all saying it. But there's only one of them in this race that has not only talked the talk but has walked the walk. And I'm proud to say I helped him do it when I went to the Senate in 1995. He is the only man that, that, that could conceive an idea that we could take over the House and the Senate, who put forth the plan in which to do that, a solid conservative plan, and then implemented that plan, and then after he implemented that plan, and it worked, did something about it. And that's why, although it seems like 500 years ago we balanced the budget year after year, we passed welfare reform, Bill Clinton said no, 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 he sent it back up there again. He said, no, no, send it back up there again. The American people got behind us and he signed it the third time. And we've been better off for it ever since. So I fr frankly think that we need somebody in these, this day and age, not a manager, uh, not somebody who will manage around the edges or bring in a bunch of consultants and get their opinions as to what to do. We don't need anybody to tell us what to do with our personal life. Most of us got wives to serve that purpose. Don't touch my junk! But uh, we need somebody who's, who's got the courage and the boldness and the experience to take that place and sh give a good, good shaking by the scruff of the neck and change things in Washington, D.C. That's why I'm here today, and that's why I'm proud to be supporting uh, Newt Gingrich for President of the United States. Thank you so very much. great to be in Nashville this afternoon. We are so proud of our many volunteers who have been working diligently on this campaign here and throughout the state of Tennessee. Thank you for your support. Newt and I are engaged in this race because we believe America is at a crossroads and care deeply about the future of this country. There are only a few months left before the most important election of our lifetime. Our only opponent is Barack Obama, and we are committed to removing him from the White House. Yeah. Newt is the only candidate with the experience and knowledge necessary to rebuild the America we love. He has a successful national record of creating jobs, balancing the budget, and reforming government. Today, 
We need a leader who can clearly articulate why President Obama and his policies are wrong for America. We need a leader who understands that we must contain and defeat our enemies. And we need a leader with bold solutions to create a better future for all Americans. I believe that leader is my husband. Please welcome former Speaker of the House and the next President of the United States, Newt Gingrich. Thank all of you and thank you, Callista. And, uh, she and I have been through an amazing amount of traveling and getting to meet people and getting to see people. I want to particularly thank our very good friend, Senator Fred Thompson. We're so thrilled that he could come and be with us. You, you should know that he's right on the edge, I think, starting Monday of shooting another movie. Uh, he's one of the movie stars that I am delighted to have hang out with me. And by the way, he used to be a U.S. Senator. Uh, and uh, I just got told that uh, Chuck Norris is going to join us later on this week, so we're, we're trying to gather up these kind of guys. I'm also delighted that my good friend Steve Gill here, uh, we've done his radio show many times over the years, and he just does a great job representing conservatism in uh, Middle Tennessee. You know, I couldn't help, as a historian, where we're standing. On the one hand, you have here the statue of Andrew Jackson. And you have over here the burial place of President James K. Polk, who is the only Speaker of the House to become President. So I have this sort of identity with this space. But I particularly want to talk about Andrew Jackson, who clearly would be astonished, and actually given Jackson's personality, you'd be enraged by Barack Obama. If you said to Andrew Jackson, who had been a commanding general, and then became commander in chief, that an American president would apologize to people who had been killing Americans, he would have just told you that his solution was rather different. Jackson understood that you want your opponents to respect you, and they don't have to like you, but they have to understand that you're formidable and you are dangerous. And the idea that we would go around the world apologizing for America would have struck Andrew Jackson as absolutely, totally irrational. And I want you to know, I want you to know that if, with your help, I win the primary next week and I go on to become President of the United States, I will not apologize to people who are killing young Americans. Part of the strategy of being able to stand up for America requires that we understand how really volatile and unstable the Middle East is and how really unfriendly to many of our values some elements, particularly radical Islamists, are. And that we adopt strategies that fit that reality. And that is why we need an American energy program that yes. makes America independent. Yeah. You got it. Hey, there you go. He just cited our, our 2008 project of drill now, drill here, pay less, which actually had the Obama administration followed it, would by now be working. The part one of why we need an American energy strategy is national security. No 
future American president should ever again bow to a Saudi king, period. And if our short-term answer to Iranian efforts to block the Straits of Hormuz through which one out of every five barrels of oil in the world goes, if our short-term answer is the U.S. Navy, our long-term answer should be producing enough oil in the United States that we don't care what the Iranians do. Let's let the Europeans and the Chinese and the Indians worry for a while because we have the capacity to be independent of energy. We can produce more oil in the United States than either Saudi Arabia or Russia, and we can be the largest oil producer in the world, which we were for 50 years. Now, there's a second practical reason to have an American energy policy. If we keep $500 billion a year here at home, we're going to create millions of new jobs right here at home and put people to work. We know this is not a theory, because in North Dakota, where they have discovered oil on private land, where Obama couldn't stop it, they discovered they have 25 times as much oil as the government thought. That's 2,500 percent as much oil. And they're now producing enough oil in North Dakota that the unemployment rate is 3.5 percent. And that actually overstates it because they have 16,000 jobs unfilled in the oil industry and the 3.5% don't have the right training to do the jobs or they would basically be at zero unemployment. That's how powerful it is. They've had seven straight tax cuts in the state government and the state government has a rainy day fund of several billion dollars with a state budget of $2 billion. So if we have an American energy policy we're going to create a tremendous number of new jobs. There's a third reason to have an American energy policy. It's been estimated by the people who've been developing North Dakota that if we opened up federal land and we opened up offshore, that over the next generation, the federal government would earn between 16 and 18 trillion dollars, not billion, trillion dollars in royalties without raising taxes. That means if we put that money to one side, got back to a balanced budget, we could virtually pay off the national debt, wipe out everything we owe to China, be economically independent of oil, and be, economic, be financially independent of foreign people buying our bonds, and we would have the healthiest and, and most successful country we've been in a very long time. So the final reason that we should develop American energy. I believe we should have as a goal getting back to $2.50 gasoline or less. I believe it is doable. I'd urge all of you to tell your friends and neighbors the next time you pull up to a gas station, when you fill up your car or truck, ask yourself how much would you have saved if we'd had the Gingrich $2.50 a gallon plan. You know, folks in Washington who are frequently out of touch with reality and have almost no historic memory think 250 is impossible. You see it on TV. Well, when I was speaker, it was $1.13. When Barack Obama was sworn in, it was $1.89. So you could argue that we're just trying to get back to the pre-Obama price level. Now, it shouldn't be that radical an idea to think that you could achieve a price level of three years ago. Yet in Washington, there are all sorts of highly sophisticated people, many of whom aren't a big enough income they don't notice the price of gasoline, will tell you this is impossible. Well, when Ronald Reagan took over from Jimmy Carter, he dramatically cut the cost of gasoline in his eight years, and the lowest point it reached was the end of Reagan's eight years, and it was substantially below where it had been eight years earlier because we followed a policy of encouraging the production of gasoline. Now, how would you do that, people say? 
Well, there's a Gingrich plan and there's an Obama plan. Now, if you see the president's speech from last week, the, and we're actually going to put together my speech Saturday, re repudiating his speech with his speech, so you kind of see what a Gingrich-Obama debate would look like. First of all, you need to realize that the president's secretary of anti-energy, <laughs> that's what he is, Secretary Chu, said several years ago he wants American gasoline prices to reach European levels. So well, that's 9 or $10 a gallon. So our first offer this fall is going to be to say to people, fine, would you like $2.50 a gallon with Newt Gingrich or 9 or $10 a gallon with Barack Obama? Now, I think probably you can go to every gas station in Tennessee and ask people and you'll find a vast majority are going to say I'd rather be with Newt Gingrich at two dollars and fifty cents than be with Barack Obama at nine or ten dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start there. Second, the president said there's no silver bullet. In fact he repeated it several times. It was a phrase he liked. But there is a presidential pen. If on the very first day I am president, about two hours after the inaugural address, I will sign into order, I will sign an executive order putting in place the Keystone Pipeline from Canada. That will bring 700,000 barrels a day to Houston from Canada and will lower the cost of bringing oil from Oklahoma, Arkansas, <laughs> Kansas, and Texas to Houston. Second, I would reestablish in the Gulf of Mexico the system we had before Obama stopped it. And that would add 400,000 barrels a day from the Gulf of Mexico in known areas that we've been developing for years. Third, I would put in order developing areas of Alaska we already know about. And that would bring another million two hundred thousand barrels a day. Now that is in three signatures, not a silver bullet, but three signatures. Two million one hundred thousand barrels a day of additional American oil brought online in a way that dramatically will affect the world market. I would also open up federal land and I would open up offshore. Now, for our friends in the media, let me be quite clear. You do not have to open up Yosemite <laughs> or Mammoth Cave or Yellowstone. We own 69% of Alaska. That is one and a half times the size of Texas. So you could say to the environmentalists, we're going to give you half of Texas. You can pick the best glaciers, the best polar bear areas. You can pick the National Park at Denali, put them all together. That leaves you an area the size of Texas to develop. Now, we've got at least two or three decades to develop an area the size of Texas, which may, by the way, have the largest coal reserves in the United States. So let's start down that road. In addition, we have a huge domestic supply of coal, as you know, right here in Tennessee, Virginia, all the way up through West Virginia. And we were promised in 2003 that the, the Department of Energy was going to develop a clean coal plant that would be a model for the future, that would make all the liberals happy. And the bureaucracy currently has targeted it for 2016. At the rate we are currently going, the Chinese will develop a clean coal plant before we do, and it will be Chinese technology being sold around the world because our Department of Energy bureaucracy is so incompetent, they cannot get the project done, which is why I recommend we abolish the Department of Energy and go back to the market. We should also build the first refineries we have built in over a generation, and to do that we should replace the Environmental Protection Agency with a brand new Environmental Solutions Agency. <laughs> you, notice, 
none of these things are accidents. And the president sort of goes, oh, gee, this is all unfortunate. It's not unfortunate. These were deliberate policies liberals put in place to minimize our ability to produce energy. And part of their reason is they don't like big trucks and big cars. And I have pointed out again and again, you cannot put a gun rack in a vault. <laughs> now, it's technically not true. We had a guy in Atlanta with a vault who did a YouTube video, and he put the gun rack in the trunk. <laughs> a friend of mine who's a South Georgia hunter looked at that video and said, yeah, but where does the deer go? So I want a system where we have American energy for national security, American energy for job creation, and where we have deliberately low cost of energy, whether it's electricity or it's gasoline, because I want you to have the freedom to have the highest quality of life in the world, and I think you should be allowed to choose the kind of car or truck you want to buy if you have earned the money. That's what's called freedom. Finally, the president offered a solution, to be fair to him. He described algae. <laughs> and he said that he was really confident in algae. He was excited by algae. Sometimes I think you almost have to be a Harvard graduate to pull off the, some of these lines. Uh, be careful. Let me be clear. I believe in science and technology. I actually believe in research into producing <coughs> fuel from algae. I believe in biofuels. But I also believe that they aren't, they're not the solution to this year or this decade. This is a president, and he did this, of course, with over a half billion dollars of your money on Solyndra, which was going to be this fabulous new company that was going to produce this fabulous new solar power. And was a great photo. This was a half billion dollar photo op. The president went to visit them. He was thrilled. They were thrilled. And then they went bankrupt. Because it turned out it wasn't economically viable. So for the president to suggest that drilling won't work, I mean, this is a perfect case of why I want to debate Obama this fall. So drilling won't work, but algae will. Do you know how out of touch with reality you have to be to say that with a straight face? I mean, it's, it's truly sort of frightening to think the President of the United States sits around, as Ronald Reagan once said, it isn't what they don't know that's a problem, it's what they know that isn't true. So I think that we can, I believe, we can offer the American people a much better future. Fight, Chad! Fight, Chad! Fight, Chad! Fight, Chad! It is easier for camels to go through the eye of a needle. No! 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 I, I, just, I just want to make one observation. In terms of being out of touch with reality, somebody, somebody who 21 years after the collapse of the Soviet Empire still has a red flag is a sign of a commitment of fantasy over reality that is breathtaking and it's proof that we are truly a free country because no matter how strange your ideas, somewhere you're allowed to scream them. <laughs>